Okay, so what we have here are two drawings. And in animation terms, these are called keys. Key means that it's the extreme position that something is going to move in. It's not going to move any further in one direction or the other. So for this one here, this is drawing number one. At the bottom here, you can see number one. So we've got a line that's standing straight up and down here. Let's focus on this one first. We've got a line that's up straight up and down. That's the start position for this line. And then when you look at drawing number three, you'll see that the same line is now on an angle over here. So if you take your paper, right now you don't have any pegs registering it. So you can take your paper, line it up on the corners there, and just hold the paper at the bottom with your fingers like this. Okay, so you're just holding the bottom like that. Take the sheet of paper in your fingers like this and just flip the drawings back and forth this way. So what you're doing is you're looking at that line now and you're creating the illusion that the line is actually tilting over from one position to the other. You can see the same thing with the ball over here. The ball is up in this position here and then it's coming down here and it's squishing on the ground. So when you flip between the two it looks like it falls to the ground and squishes. When you look at the square over here, the second one turns into a rectangle, so it looks like it's moving from one position to the other. This one here, we've got a bent line going this way, and this one has the bent line going the opposite way, so it looks like it's wagging back and forth. So what we're doing, <coughs> by flipping the drawings like this, is we're creating what's called persistence of vision. Persistence of vision means that our eyes, when we see this line here, our eyeball retains it for a fraction of a section and when we switch it over to this other one here it creates the illusion that it's actually moving from one position to another even though it's not okay it's just two lines they're not moving anywhere it's just that they've been positioned in a different place so it creates the illusion of movement between these two so the key positions show the start position and the stop position and what we need to do as animators is we need to understand in our minds what it is that our object is doing, where we're starting it from and where we're moving it to. Now in this case here we only have two drawings. We have drawing number one and we have drawing number three. If we were to take this and shoot this on a computer using a camera, we would expose this for two frames. So for one twelfth of a second we would see this line here and then for one twelfth of a second we'd see this one. So the illusion would be something very quick like this. It would just flitter back and forth like this very, very quickly. So in order for us to create the illusion that this is moving in time from one position to another, we have to fill in the blank spaces in between with what are called in-betweens. Okay? The drawings that go in between your two keys are called in-between drawings. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your blank sheet of paper and put it over top of this one. And again, line up your corners so you've got the corner edges matched up. Again, if we had this punched, your, your peg bar would do the, the registration for you. So what we have is your blank sheet of paper on top, your number one drawing, and then your number three drawing. So it seems not quite right that we have put the drawing that is going to be the in-between drawing on top and not in between the two drawings. The reason for this is because we're actually going to draw on this sheet of paper. So we need that sheet of paper to be on top of the other two. Which now means that we have to flip the papers in a specific way in order to create the illusion that they're moving. And so this is always the fun part of year that I really enjoy because this is the first time most of you are ever going to do this. And it's going to be very awkward, but you're going to have to learn it. Because this is one of those mandatory things that you must learn in order to animate. So here's how I want you to hold the paper. Take the first sheet of paper between your pointing finger and your thumb, okay, put the first sheet of paper in between those two, like this. So you're making an OK sign, and you've got the first sheet of paper there. These two fingers right here, I want you to grab the second sheet of paper in between those two, like this. All right. So now you're holding the top sheet of paper and the middle sheet of paper. The bottom one we don't touch. We just let it lie on the disk, or on the, de the desk. So what we're going to do now is we're going to Expose drawing number one, so you pull the first blank sheet of paper towards you like this. So you've got the middle drawing so that we can see it. So you're spreading your fingers apart like this. Okay, showing drawing number one. Then we're going to push the top drawing down to show the blank sheet of paper. 
and then we're going to pull both of them to show the third sheet of paper. Right. So we're looking at the middle, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Right. So doing it very slow, just do it very slow like I'm doing it at first. So it's middle, spread your fingers apart, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Now, eventually what you should do, and I'm just going to jump forward in time and show you, this is how you should be able to do it within the next two weeks. Right? Watch what I'm doing. That's how effortlessly and smoothly you should be able to do it. So you're creating the illusion that this thing is moving. Okay? It's the exact same action that we just did in slow motion. Middle, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Okay, so what I want you to do is slowly work up your speed so that you're doing it like this. It's got to go middle, top, bottom. Okay, don't do this. If you're doing this, you're doing it wrong. All you're doing is you're pulling the top one, the middle, and the bottom. You're just flipping it forward. That's called roll flipping. Okay, what we're doing here is we're in between flipping where we pull it apart, down, all towards you. Middle, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Middle, top, bottom. Okay, it's going to be really awkward at first, and I'm going to joke to you about it later on in the semester. When we get to the end of the semester and you guys are all pros at this, I'm going to bring up the point. Remember the first day when we learned how to do this? And you guys were all like, bye, 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 bye. I don't get it. Okay. It'll just show you that we're progressing through. Okay. So let's stop flipping now for just a second because that's something you're going to practice in all your spare time now. Eventually, you will get to the point where I draw with my right hand. So right now, I'm holding the papers down at the bottom with my left hand. I'm flipping with my right hand. Okay. But I draw with my right hand, which means I should be holding a pencil right now in my right hand. So if I do that, I'm holding my pencil like this, I should be able to flip with my left hand. Can I do it? You bet I can, because I've learned how to do it. I've learned how to become ambidextrous with this. Okay? I can flip with either hand. I'm talking to you guys. I'm not even looking at the paper, but I'm flipping and it's nice and smooth. Okay? I could be asleep right now and I'd still be flipping like this. I'm going to take my shoes off and I'll show you how I can flip with my toes. No, I can't do that. <laughs> but you should, you should become so proficient at this that you can do it with either hand because eventually you will have to be able to do it with either hand. Because in this instance here, the drawing is over in this portion of the paper, right? So when I'm holding it with my left hand, if I'm drawing with my right hand and I'm holding the papers, sorry, I've got to get the papers separated here. If I'm flipping with my left hand, see where my fingers are? They're right over top where I have to draw. So that's very awkward. So what I would do is I would put the, the paper down like this. I would in between the drawing with my pencil hand, and then I would flip with my pencil hand as well to see the action that's going on there. If I want to see what's going on over here, I'd flip with this hand over on this side. Okay. So that's why becoming ambidextrous with this is really, really important to be able to do it with both hands. Right? Not at the same time, but... Alright, so that's the, that's the mechanical process. What does that do for you? The process of flipping the papers the way we've just done it here is it gives you an instantaneous pencil test to say whether or not your action is working properly. Right? So what I want you to do is I want you to take these two key drawings here, drawing number one and drawing number three, and I want you to do drawing number two. So down at the bottom corner here, write number two. Don't put a circle around it. Keys have circles around them. This is a key with a circle around it. This is an in-between drawing, so there's no circle around it. Right. What I want you to do is I want you to draw the line that goes in between these two points. Okay. If our line is moving from this position to this position here, there are a number of different options. So yes, we could find the exact halfway position for each of these. So that we look at the bottom point of this line here and the top of this line just looking through the paper is there. And then I find the other point here is over here and here. We could just do the mathematical equation where we look at the distance from here to here 
and the distance from here to here and say half the distance is there, half the <coughs> distance is there, and we simply draw the line halfway in between like this. Okay, yeah, that would serve the mechanical function of getting it from one point to the other like that smoothly. Okay. But what we could also do is change the <coughs> dynamics of how that moves and say that not everything is necessarily moving at the same time. So the bottom part, I could have bending like this. And doing that. So now when I flip it, it's doing that. So it's got more of a pliable feel to it. Okay, which creates a different sensation of what that line is doing. So when it snaps, it goes from this position, snap, hard, it feels like it's hitting very quickly. And that has to do with the amount of space that I leave between it. So here's one of the first rules of, of animation that we're going to start to deal with is that when we're drawing our lines, our ro lines represent the space that is being moved from one position to another. It also determines the speed at which something moves. So between these two drawings here, you can see that the top point does not move very much. That means that it's moving slower here and from here to here it's moving faster because the distance that it's moving is greater. Right? It's just one drawing in between, but because it's moving less here, it moves slower and then faster. So it affects the speed at which it moves. If I make everything exactly halfway, it's a mechanical movement. It's all moving at the same time. But by varying the distance on different parts of it, will create a sense of speed or slowness to it. Right? So now when we move to our next one here, let's go to the ball. We've got the ball in the high point here as a circle, and over here it's in a squished position. So again, I want you to put the ball in the halfway position. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the ball from the center point here, there's the center of the ball there, down to the center here, which is here. We have to understand, number one, what is the path of action? Path of action means where is the ball moving from and to, and how does it get there? So we could have that go in a straight line if we wanted to, as if it's just being shot straight down. But chances are it's being tossed, so it's going to have a little bit of a looping action. It'll work on an arc. So a path of action for animation, for any given object or any given line or endpoint on a line, is either going to be in a straight line or it's going to be in a curved line that forms either a C curve, like this, or it could be an S curve. We could say that this ball is going to go like this and out like that. But that would be kind of weird for it to move out like that. Why would the ball loop and come out here and then drop down? Unless it was a balloon, right? A balloon could do that. If we pushed it down here, the air current could push it out and over and drop it down. So there again is the question, what is this object and how is it moving and why is it moving that way? So that will determine a number of different things. Number one, our path of action, which could be straight as if we just threw it really hard straight down and it moves in a straight line, or we're tossing it and it sort of loops over in a curved path of action, or it's very light and the wind is just lightly blowing it down. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it on an arced path of action like this, and we're going to find the halfway point between the two centers, which is right there. Now, in the first drawing, the ball is a circle. In the second drawing, it's squished. A halfway position, if we went mechanically, would be the ball going from a circle to partly squished to fully squished at the bottom, right? So it would have a transition between the two. But if this is a ball dropping through the air, what's causing the ball to deform? Of what? It's the surface. Uh, but it hasn't reached the surface yet. It reaches the surface down here. So it's squishing at the bottom down here. We assume that it's touching the surface. Is there anything affecting the ball here in the middle of the air? Yeah. Other than the air. But the air would not cause the ball to deform right. or right. distort. The velocity? The velocity, yeah. Velocity could affect it. So what we could do is we could say it's going from here and it's going faster, which would then cause us to stretch the ball in this position here, which would make it appear to be going faster. Okay. 
So again, questions that have to be raised. Why? How? What is it made up of? Okay. Also, the, uh, the path it's taking. Yep. The path of action will also affect what's going on. Right? So if it was a straight line, chances are it's like it's being fired out very quickly, so therefore we would stretch it. But if it's looping out like this, it's like someone's tossing the ball, therefore it wouldn't be affected, so it would stay a circle. So the halfway position for this one really on this path of action should be a circle like that. Which then creates the motion when we flip it. It's falling through the air and then it's being affected by the fact that it hits the ground and squishing. <coughs> so now let's move around to the next one over here. Our line down at the bottom here. So we've got a curved line here and a curved line here. So we could say Maybe this is like a ruler, a metal ruler that we're looking at on the side. And you're actually physically bending the ruler so that when you release that, it's being held down here. When we release it, it's just going to straighten out in the center and then go to the bent position on the opposite side. So your halfway position for this one could just be straight out like this. Which would create that flippy floppy type feel. Which I have to turn the paper in order to see it properly here. We create this type of an effect here, where it has more of a, a wagging type of a feel, like a dog's tail. Okay. Or it could be more malleable, where we're holding on to it like this and we're pushing it very hard this way, but then we pull back, like cracking a whip, which would mean that this part here would go this way and this part here would drag. So the line would actually be more like that. Or if we're snapping it, we're pulling back on this part, it could cause this part to go this way and this part to go this way, forming an S-curve instead of C-curve. That could be the halfway position on it. So again, questions need to be asked. Why? What's it made of? How is it doing it? Okay, think of those things, and that'll answer your questions. So now this final one, We've got a square that turns into a rectangle. So is this metamorphosis that's taking place? Is the box sliding sideways and then elongating itself, metamorphosizing into a rectangular shape? Or is this actually a rectangular box that we're looking at the end of the box in perspective? And what's happening is it's pivoting on this point here and twisting and rolling up into its upright position. So if we were to draw this in proper perspective, we'd have a vanishing point that's here. If we could see inside the box, this would be the inside. So it's going back like this. And then when it flips up into its upright position, if we're using the exact same vanishing point, which is over here, then our perspective would look like this. We'd see the edges of the box here. So the box is actually flipping and rotating, <coughs> which would cause us to three-dimensionally turn the box and rotate it in space. So we'd have to start to think of the dimension of the box and the perspective, and where is the new vanishing point on an inclined plane. Ooh, that's a lot of stuff to think about. Okay, So all of a sudden now we're introducing the idea of dimension and depth into it. And how do we affect the drawing in order to make it work properly? So once again, these are all questions that must be asked before you just dive in and start dropping in-betweens in. 